Chapter 13 I made my way from the fire and smoke of Burning Weybridge towards London. I found an abandoned boat, very small and remote, drifting downstream. Jumping aboard, I escaped out of that destruction. There were no oars in the boat, but I contrived to paddle as well as my parboiled hands would allow. I followed the river because I considered that the water gave me my best chance of escape should these giants return. For a long time I drifted. I landed on the Middlesex bank and lay down, deadly sick, amid the long grass. I suppose the time was then about four or five o'clock. Some hours later I got up, walked perhaps half a mile without meeting a soul, and then lay down again in the shadow of a hedge. I seemed to remember talking to myself during that last spurt. I was also very thirsty and bitterly regretted that I had not drunk more water. I do not clearly remember the arrival of the curate, so probably I dozed. I became aware of him as a seated figure in soot-smudged shirt sleeves. His upturned, clean-shaven face was staring at a faint flickering that danced over the sky in the midsummer sunset. I sat up and he looked at me quickly. Have you any water? I asked abruptly. He shook his head. You have been asking for water for the last hour, he said. For a moment we were silent, taking stock of each other. I dare say he found me a strange enough figure, naked, save for my water-soaked trousers and socks, scalded, and my face and shoulders blackened by smoke. His face was weak, his eyes were rather large, pale blue and blankly staring. He spoke abruptly, looking vacantly away from me. What does it mean? he said. What do these things mean? I stared at him and made no answer. He extended a thin white hand and spoke in almost a complaining tone. The morning service was over. I was walking through the roads to clear my brain for the afternoon and then fire, earthquake, death, all our work undone. What are these Martians? What are we? I answered, clearing my throat. He gripped his knees and turned to look at me again. For half a minute, perhaps, he stared silently. What have we done? What has Weybridge done? Everything's gone. Everything's destroyed. The church? We rebuilt it only three years ago. Gone. Swept out of existence. Why? Another pause. And he broke out in biblical verse again, like one demented. The smoke of her burning goeth up for ever and ever, he shouted. His eyes flamed and he pointed a lean finger in the direction of Weybridge. By this time, I was beginning to take his measure. The tremendous tragedy in which he had been involved had driven him to the very verge of his reason. What are we to do? he asked. Are these creatures everywhere? Has the earth been given over to them? Things have changed, I said quietly. You must keep your head. There is still hope. Hope? Yes. I began to explain my view of our position. He listened at first, but as I went on, his regard wandered from me. This must be the beginning of the end, he said, interrupting me. The end, the great and terrible day of the Lord. I struggled to my feet. Standing over him, I laid my hand on his shoulder. Be a man, said I. What good is religion if it collapses under calamity? Think of what earthquakes and floods, wars and volcanoes have done before to men. 
Did you think God had exempted Weybridge? He is not an insurance agent. For a time he sat in blank silence. But how can we escape? he asked suddenly. They are invulnerable. Not invulnerable, I answered. One of them was killed yonder, not three hours ago. Killed? he said, staring about him. I saw it happen, I said. As I spoke, he sprang to his feet and stopped me by a gesture. Listen, he said. From beyond the low hills across the water came the dull resonance of distant guns and a remote, weird crying. Then everything was still. Chapter 14 My younger brother was a medical student in London when the Martians landed at Woking. He heard nothing of their arrival until reading a short news report about it in the morning paper on Saturday. The Martians, alarmed by the approach of a crowd, had killed a number of people with a quick-firing gun. So the story ran. The report concluded with the words, The Martians have not moved from the pit into which they have fallen, and indeed seem incapable of doing so. My brother was not anxious, but he made up his mind to get a late train to Woking that night. He sent a telegram which never reached me about four o'clock and spent the evening at a music hall. Then he caught a cab in a thunderstorm to Waterloo Station. He waited for some time at the platform from which the midnight train usually starts. Eventually, a railway official told him that an accident was preventing trains from reaching Woking that night. What kind of accident? We don't know, sir. The telegraph lines are down. It's best to come back tomorrow. My brother went to church in the morning, still in ignorance of what had happened on the previous night. There, he heard allusions made to the invasion and a special prayer for peace. Coming out, he bought a Sunday paper. Alarmed at the news in this, he went again to Waterloo Station to find out if communication had been restored. At the station, he heard for the first time that several remarkable telegrams had been received in the morning from Byfleet and Chertsey stations, but that these had abruptly ceased. The train service was now very much disorganised. One or two trains came in from Richmond, Putney and Kingston. A man in a blue and white blazer addressed my brother, full of strange tidings. There's hosts of people driving into Kingston with boxes of valuables and all that, he said. They say there's been guns heard at Chertsey. Heavy firing. Mounted soldiers have told them to leave at once because the Martians are coming. But the Martians can't get out of their pit, can they? About five o'clock, police came into the station and began to clear the public off the platforms. My brother went out into the street again. The church bells were ringing for evensong and a squad of Salvation Army lassies came singing down Waterloo Road. On the bridge, a number of loafers were watching a curious brown scum that came drifting down the river in patches. The sun was just setting and the clock tower and the Houses of Parliament rose against one of the most peaceful skies it is possible to imagine. My brother bought a newspaper. What he read in it shocked him profoundly. He learned that the Martians were not merely a handful of small sluggish creatures. They were vast spider-like machines, nearly a hundred feet high, capable of the speed of an express train and able to shoot out a beam of intense heat. Five of the machines had been seen moving towards the Thames and one had been destroyed. Heavy losses of soldiers were mentioned, but the tone of the dispatch was optimistic. 
The Martians are not invincible. Guns are being sent from across the country to deal with them. The army believes it can destroy any further cylinders with high explosives. The newspaper editorial urged the public not to panic. The Martians are strange and terrible, but there cannot be more than 20 of them against our millions. All through central London, people could be seen reading the pink sheets. My brother saw some of the fugitives from West Surrey. The faces of these people were haggard. My brother talked to several of these fugitives, hoping for news of me. One man told him that Woking had been entirely destroyed on the previous night. I come from Byfleet, he said. Soldiers came through the place in the early morning and ran from door to door, warning us to come away. We went out to look, and there were clouds of smoke to the south. So I've locked up my house and come here. About eight o'clock, the noise of heavy firing was distinctly audible all over the south of London. My brother, walking through the quiet back streets to the river, heard it quite plainly. He walked from Westminster to his apartments near Regent's Park. He was now very anxious on my account and disturbed at the evident magnitude of the trouble. My brother went to bed a little after midnight. He was awakened from lurid dreams in the small hours of Monday by the sound of door knockers, feet running in the street, distant drumming and a clamour of bells. Red reflections danced on the ceiling. For a moment he lay astonished, wondering whether day had come or the world gone mad. Then he jumped out of bed and ran to the window. Up and down the street, dozens of windows opened. A policeman was going from house to house, hammering at each door. They are coming, bawled the policeman. The Martians are coming. Bells rang out from every church within earshot. Doors were opening, and window after window in the houses opposite flashed from darkness into yellow illumination. Up the street came galloping a closed carriage. Close on the rear of this came a couple of cabs and then a long procession of flying vehicles. They were going to Chalk Farm Station where special trains to the northwest were loading up. For a long time my brother stared out of the window in blank astonishment. Then the door behind him opened and the man who lodged across the landing came in, dressed only in shirt, trousers and slippers. What's happening? he asked. A fire? What a devil of a row! They both craned their heads out of the window, straining to hear what the policemen were shouting. People were coming out of the side streets and standing in groups on corners, talking. What the devil is this all about? said my brother's fellow lodger. My brother began to dress, running with each garment to the window in order to miss nothing of the growing excitement. A man selling unnaturally early newspapers came bawling into the street. London in danger of suffocation. Massacres in the Thames Valley. And all about him, in the rooms through all the vastness of London, from Ealing to East Ham, people were rubbing their eyes and opening windows to stare out and ask aimless questions. It was the dawn of the Great Panic. London had gone to bed on Sunday night, oblivious and inert. It was awakened in the small hours of Monday morning to a vivid sense of danger. My brother went down and out into the street just as the sky grew pink with the early dawn. Black smoke, he heard people crying, and again, black smoke. As he hesitated on the doorstep, he saw another news vendor approaching and got a paper forthwith. And from this paper, my brother read that catastrophic dispatch 
of the Commander-in-Chief. The Martians are firing rockets, creating enormous clouds of black and poisonous vapour, and are advancing slowly towards London. They are destroying everything on the way. It is impossible to stop them. There is no safety from the black smoke but in instant flight. That was all, but it was enough. The whole population of the great six million city began pouring en masse northward 